right, good morning, Irwell College. Before we get started, I just want to shout out uh, our class president, Stephanie Wilson. Today's her birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. So I'm Colonel Mendez from Seminar 6. All right. Negotiations are part of our daily lives. Anything from a suspense extension, resource allocation, or the latest Facebook marketplace acquisition. It's the process in which two or more parties maneuver and assert their interests. Like strategic leadership, negotiations at the strategic level will take on a new dimension. New dimensions our guest speaker will discuss this morning. Today we're privileged to have Dr. Stefan Eisen, the author of the second reading of, for this morning's IP, and the founding director of the Air Force Negotiation Center here at Maxwell, and the former dean of Air War College. He's an expert in all forms of negotiation and brings over 42 years of active duty and civil service experience with him today uh, for this presentation. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Eisen. Welcome. What's the purpose of a PhD? To state the obvious with arrogance, okay? <laughs> all right, I am not going to teach you how to negotiate an hour and 15 minutes, uh, plus a couple cute slides. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, tell you that you already are good negotiators. You wouldn't have gotten this far in your career and your lives if you hadn't been. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about what gets in your way as you rise to the senior ranks of responsibility and leadership uh, right between your ears because your brain is not designed to be a negotiating brain. Your brain is designed to be a survival brain. And we're going to talk about a couple of things that get in the way. We're also going to talk about a couple models because one of my few foot stompers I have for this entire uh, presentation is, as a senior leader, you don't need to act faster, you need to act slower. You need to do things more deliberately uh, because there's a couple things that are working in your brain against you being an effective leader. So that's what we're gonna dis discuss this morning, okay? Uh, yeah, 42 years. Uh, I'm so old I had a draft number. That's kind of scary. Bottom line up front, always. Why should you even listen? to this lecture, why should you pay attention in the seminar, and why should you uh, earnestly engage in the exercises? Uh, you can read faster than I can talk. That's your world. Now, why do I put that up there? Well, about a generation or so ago, that wasn't the world. Uh, before Goldwater Nichols, everybody was stovepiped in their service. The wing commander owned all the resources and all the information, and from that came the directives. And when the wing commander said jump, you said how high on the way up? Well, now you're charged with working with people you have absolutely no control over. You, not, you, you gotta work with them, okay? Your span of responsibility is this big and your span of control is much smaller. How do you fill that gap? By being an effective negotiator, by being a good influencer. So that's one thing they should be paying attention to. Oh, there we go. Also, things get a lot more complicated as a senior leader, you will probably lead organizations that you have absolutely no organizational expertise in. I was a basic military training commander. I was not a qualified military training instructor. I led Air Force ROTC at the headquarters. I'm an academy grad, okay? So there's a lot of information out there that you're not the expert on. In fact, when you have a computer problem nowadays, do you go up the chain of command to solve it or do you find the youngest airman in the unit, okay? Uh, information is incredibly democratized nowadays, and your job is that second bullet. If you get nothing else out of this year, you gotta stop coming up with the perfect answer and start creating the perfect question because the information is probably somewhere out there. And that requires re really good critical thinking skills, and we'll talk about that in a second. We're gonna talk about systems one, systems two thinking. How many folks have read about that before? Okay, so I can, only I can only lie to about half the audience. The rest of you folks won't know the difference. Bias, we're gonna talk about bias management. And influence susceptibility. In fact, you had a little bit of readings on influence susceptibility. Uh, you don't have to take pictures of the slides, they're gonna be available on the drive, okay? How many folks are married? Read that top bullet. <laughs> the checkbook is half full, no, it's half empty, okay? And you have diversity in garrison. I'm not gonna use diversity as a bad word. It's a good word. Uh, I like to problem solve with folks that think differently than I do because if everybody in the room thinks just like I do, guess what? They're gonna come up with the same answer I came up with, so why have the meeting in the first place, okay? Uh, and then intercultural contrast. I'm gonna spend a, a slide on uh, something called the Hall's high-low context. How many folks have read about that? 
Good, so I can lie to everybody in this room and it won't matter. Okay, uh, the internationals, I want you to really give me some good, yeah, I agree. With, oh, no, that's not the way America, because I think you're going to have some fun in the seminars you discuss of how culture influences the way people negotiate and how they approach negotiations. And we're going to do some tools, some suggested tools to help to slow down that process and make it more deliberate. And Here's your choice, folks. You were a second lieutenant or a junior officer at one point, an ensign. You had 24 hours in a day. You're a senior leader, and guess what? There's still just 24 hours in a day. And yet you've got to make more decisions, and you can try to work longer hours, which is just going to burn you out, OK? Uh, you can work harder, which is just going to burn you out. Or really, slow your brain down a little bit, engage a, a certain thinking process. It's called systems two. We'll cover that in a second and make the process a little more deliberate, okay? And I think you'll find you have better results. You're gonna respond to situations instead of react to them. Now, if there's a crisis, if buildings are on fire, people are dying, and airplanes are crashing, absolutely, you're in a crisis reaction mode. But when the time and resources allow it, you should switch your brain from one system to the other. And that's a practical guide. That's the brochure you probably got a couple months ago, Welcome to the Air War College. You know, show up, read a couple of books, <coughs> drink a little coffee. Probably some weeks at the War College are going to feel a little more like this. I'm sorry this is not a COVID compliance slide. I should have face masks on everybody, but I don't. <laughs> OK. That's you. You're the cat. You're going, oh my god. The problem is uh, everybody else has got an opposable thumb on that raft, so they can grab onto something. You're the cat. You don't have an opposable thumb, so you're going to go flying through the air. That's what some weeks might feel like. OK. What are we going to do? You're going to assess the environment. We don't walk in a negotiation. You don't walk onto a battlefield until what? You've done battlefield prep. So do, apply that skill set to a negotiation. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about how these two models relate, the, the typo model, trust information, power, and options, and then the five strategies. We're going to talk about those habits of mind, systems one, systems two, thinking, and that stuff, what gets in the way of being an effective negotiator a little bit about cultural perspectives, and finally, some multi-party considerations, because you didn't have any readings on multi-party. But you're going to practice some today. All right. I heard that you all are really good at self-organizing, so I want you to find a battle buddy, a wingman. In other words, pair up. Pair up right now. Find somebody you want to talk to for the next couple of minutes. <laughs> Look at that. Instant. OK, now you've got to make a decision. Oh, God, this early in the morning, you really got to make a decision. One of you is going to be lead, and one of you is going to be the wingman. So figure it out, I want out, OK? <laughs> All right. Raise your hand if you're lead. Raise your hand if you're lead. OK, what? that means, OK, great. Lead, I want you to think about and decide upon in the next couple of seconds something that you would never do or buy. I'd never bungee jump. I'd never buy an expensive car, whatever, OK? I want you to relate that to your wingman. Wingman, you've got two minutes to convince lead to do or and or buy that very thing they just told you that they would never do or buy. Go. I was going to buy a What would you never do buy? Buy a minivan. Okay, and how's it going? We're getting there. <laughs> I'm listening. So like, we were talking about, I saw a minivan that has a sticker on the back of it. It's like, I would never own a minivan, so it could be a little self-effacing. And um, then you pop the, the patch on the back. It's got a self-contained self vacuum cleaner, so you don't even have to go. Okay, you got to admit it. <laughs> what will you all never do or buy?
Time's up. Time's up. How many folks are wildly successful? Yeah, there's a couple. All right. Uh, I was listening in over here. I'd never buy a minivan. And we we're talking about built. Uh, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. I've owned one since 85. I make up for it by driving that little red sled out there called Corvette. So, you know, it's, it's a kind of a balancing act. You'd never buy a minivan. And you're talking about vacuum cleaners and uh, all the convenience items and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, over here, it was never buy a Maserati because, after all, America, right? Pickup trucks. And uh, no luck there. Uh, num the wingman, I want you to think about something. When that lead turned to you and said, I'm never going to do whatever or never buy whatever, did you also go, well, hell, I don't want to do that either. <laughs> Guess what, senior leaders? You're going to be doing that as a senior leader. Unless it's illegal and moral and unethical, you've got to advocate for it. Wow, think about that for a second. Sometimes you've got to negotiate with yourself to figure out how you're going to influence and negotiate with that other person when fundamentally you're going, yeah, I kind of agree with this person. I don't want a Maserati. Uh, we, we had a little bit of fun here. I said, well, what modest Roddy built a plant in the U.S.? And he said, well, I got a pickup truck. Well, what if they built a pickup truck? Well, you know, America, what if they put a Ford Triton V10 in there? Well, I don't like the V10. Oh, come on. <laughs> Work with me, dude. All right. The big thing, the Morton thing, is not whether you were successful or not, is analyze, self-analyze your conversation. Was it marked with periods or question marks? Periods end conversations. Question marks continue them. Okay, uh, I love to do this. Literally, I've done this game tens of thousands of times in the last 20 years, and I love it when I do it with young airmen, because they read up there that you know I'm retired twice and all that stuff, and I'm probably rich as all get out and everything else, and and I tell them I'd never buy an expensive car, and they say, well, you're a retired colonel, you're retired, you know, you've got a doctorate to go, you should be buying, you should, oh, you should, you should, and they're, they're literally, figuratively, thumping their finger in my chest, all statements. What is my brain doing psychologically? It's digging in. How dare you challenge my decision? Okay? Think about that when you're negotiating. When you're thumping your finger on somebody, you better have one thing on your side. That's power to enforce whatever you're trying to tell the other person to do that they don't want to do. However, if you turn it into a question mark, okay, why don't you want to buy an expensive car? Could you define what an expensive car is? Some folks think $100,000 is expensive. I'm cheap. I think $20,000 is expensive. Yada, yada. I mean, what about, what about, what if? Are we the Ford Triton V10. What about Maserati building a truck in America, of all things? If you use questions at a ratio, you know, and this is me ballparking, five questions to every statement, that's a pretty effective negotiation. Because what you're doing is you get on the other side to talk. The more they talk, the more information you get. The more information you get out there, sharing information is an, a, a way to try to find common ground, okay? Uh, the way the airman usually ends up getting me, he says, I think your wife would think you'd look good in a Corvette. <laughs> okay, I'll go buy a Corvette. <laughs> it all comes to this, okay? Now, the second piece of this is uh, a lot of folks think that negotiations is a task management process. Military culture orients you to that. Why? Because none of your OPRs say, mm, your, prof your proficiency reports I sort of made progress towards a goal. Kind of came in under budget. Okay. It's all about getting the job done, getting on time, hopefully under budget. It's, we think it's a task management process. I will tell you that I advocate that it is a trust management process as much as a task management process, and that's why we built this model. Uh, we actually based this on some conversations we had with some special operators down at Herbert Field years ago when they were talking about influence operations. And first, you have to build trust. Well, quick coverage, what's, what kind of trust, process, and personal trust? Most industrialized nations have process trust. How many folks bank online? I mean, some folks get mortgages online nowadays. Why? Because we have a fairly strong legal and, and, and uh, governmental system. We tend, as a culture, to have process trust. A lot of parts in the world, I must know you before I deal with you. It's personal-based trust. Now, you don't have to go across the ocean to get that kind of trust. You go to Sumter County, Alabama, which is West Alabama, rural. You're not from around here. You've got to find a relationship first, OK? Um, I am a native-born Canadian. I grew up in Connecticut, married a girl from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, OK? Personal trust is a big thing in the Deep South. Uh, I used to build houses before my, my draft number came up. Everything up north is based on process trust. It's all written contracts. Down here, everything's on a handshake. 
okay? So there's two kinds of trust. Now, let's say you've you all been together for a little over a month now. You've built some trust amongst you, plus you all wear the uniform. There's a fundamental element of trust for folks that wear the uniform. What if I took every one of you, put you on a bus, took you up to Atlanta Airport, and you did the same exercise with somebody that I randomly picked at the international terminal? Would you have the same free-flowing conversation? Probably not. Why? You don't know them. You don't trust them. And that's why I advocate the trust, because from that flows a lot of other things, okay? If you trust somebody quite a bit, you're probably wearing, willing to share power, okay? If you don't trust them, you're probably going to use your power over them. If you share sharing power, you're sharing power with. If you don't trust the other person, you're probably just going to use your information as you go to the negotiation. If you trust the, fo the folks, you're going to use both. If you implicitly trust them, yes, dear, I'd like to go anywhere you'd like to go for dinner tonight. It's their information only, okay? You see how trust infects these two, which affects the number of options you may pursue in a negotiation. If you don't trust the other side, you're going to go with your option. In fact, the whole purpose of the negotiation the whole meeting is about you hammering your, your idea home and getting the other side to capitulate versus a more cooperative pr process where you're going to be sharing information, sharing power, and maybe exploring many options before you come to a final solution. So you see how these things interrelate, and it's iterative. It just, you don't go through this model once. It actually changes during a negotiation. Sometimes trust goes up. Sometimes trust goes down. We'll talk about that. Now, this relates to the other model. But then there's a thing about Western culture. A uh, story was related to me. In fact, in here in the War College when I was a prof here a long time ago, there's a spider on a path between two villages. And every time you walk past this spider, it bites you in the ankle. It's not lethal, but it's very painful. And my international student turns to my American and says, next time you walk past that spider, what are you going to do? Steal it. it. Step on it. Solve the problem. Okay, whoops. I want to go back here. I want to solve the problem. And my international says, you know, there's different ways to solve problems. How about if you find a different path around that spider? It might be a little longer, a little rockier, but both you and the spider get to live. Or how about if you come up with a little salve that you rub on that bite afterwards that makes it not hurt so much? One of the fundamental things you've got to think about in a negotiation is what does the other side want to do? Do they want to solve the problem just like you, kill the spider? Or maybe they have a different intended path. And that affects how a negotiation goes, okay? Sometimes the other side won't have the resources or the time to solve the problem. Maybe all they've got right now is cope with it until it's overcome by events or something else. That's something to think about. Okay, the two models. How many folks are married? Okay, let's go through the typo model real quick. Lots of trust, going to go with their information. Power is not important, going to go with their option. Which one of these strategies? Yes, dear. Comply strategy. Very oriented in what the other side wants to get done. Any option is OK with you. See how those two relate? I don't trust the other side. In fact, I hate them. I'm going to use all my power to hammer them down. In fact, I'm going to try to destroy the relationship. I'm only going to use my information. The whole purpose of the meeting is to advocate for my idea. Goes to the insist strategy. Very high on the task orientation. Really don't care if I take care of the other side. These two interrelate. And during a negotiation, you ought to pre before the negotiation, assess the environment, figure out, well, what might be a good starting point. And then as negotiation evolves, you can actually move between strategies based on your reevaluation over here. That's how these two models work. Now, what's unique about this model then from all the commercial models and all that other kind of stuff is we can assign negative values because we're in the military. We can deny the other side the ability to get their thing done, okay, over here. And we can lower the importance of getting what we want to a negative value. In fact, we can destroy the relationship over here if we wanted to. And sometimes your boss will tell you, I want you to lord over the other side in this negotiation. I want you to win at all costs, so to speak. So that's how these two models work together. Again, this is not, I'm not going to make an expert negotiator in an hour and 15 minutes, but these two models ought to give you pause and, OK, where can I use this? You can use this anywhere. You can use this at home with your family. You can use it downtown when you're buying your next refrigerator. Uh, you can use it at work. It, it's, a, it's a life skill, not just a skill that you use when your uniform is on. Now, there is a sixth uh, negotiating strategy. It's called a whatever strategy. And this is actually a picture in Montgomery, Alabama, taken a couple years ago. And it says, OK, 
Okay, lost job, can't pay mortgage, wife left, took the dog, house the gym, except for asbestos. I'll take your best offer. I mean, that's kind of a give up strategy. I don't think I would put all that. There's a difference between disclosing information and full disclosure, and I think this is a little bit too much, but anyway. Now let's talk about what gets in the way of being an effective negotiator, being, using those models. I know the models, I'm gonna use them, but then all of a sudden it just doesn't work, okay? Uh, this is a great book, don't read it. In the next minute and a half, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know from this 200 some odd page odd book, okay? Systems one, systems two. How many folks have heard about it before? Okay, great. I can only lie to half of you. Systems one, it's the uh, back part of your brain it's called the lizard brain. It's what makes you breathe in and out. It's called your daily function brain, your get or done brain, okay? It takes care of most of your decisions. It's the easiest path to good enough. Think about this for a second and remember it because we're gonna relate it to the systems two quote. Quickly relate, confirm, in other words, it's believes what's coming in, automatically believe, get it, get it going, okay? Get her done, move on. It's part of our survival system. Our brain was built to survive because the faster you solve problem A, the faster you can move on to problem B. The faster you solve all your problems, the more likely you are to survive, okay? There's nothing wrong with this part of your brain. It just exists. If you're an MBTI type, it's the J, the last letter. You react to the situation to survive. You go back to a pattern, you look for the pattern. If it fits, you move on. That's convergent thinking. As time goes on, you're taking options off the table. Nothing wrong with that. Systems two, prefrontal cortex, right up here. It's a creative part of your brain. Deliberately compares intentionally disbelieving. Okay, it's a big part of your brain up here. It's the divergent thinker. As time goes on, you're adding options to the table. If you're MBTI, Myers-Briggs type indicator, it's the P, the last letter. It's you are responding to create. Two totally different systems. You ever drive down the freeway especially down here in the Deep South, sometimes you got major stretches of interstate where there's no traffic. About 20 miles later, you go, how'd I get here? You're daydreaming, yeah? That's systems one, systems one driving. Only until that 18-wheeler starts to veer into your lane do you start to go back to systems two going, what should I do now, okay? Here's your problem, folks. All that experience, everybody says experience is good. It is, it's absolutely fantastic, except it can also get in your way. The older, more successful you are, the stronger your systems one process is. Two is lazy, it's more than happy. And this has been, I mean, they've wired people's brains up. And number of systems one is lighting up like crazy and systems two is just relaxing, going, yeah, okay, no problem, take care of it. I really don't care, okay? And nobody has adrenaline as a senior leader. Nothing ever explodes on your desk or on the flight line or down in the missile silo goes wrong, right? And as soon as adrenaline starts pumping in, guess what? It's that fight or flight reaction. React versus respond, it kicks in systems one. It's working against you when you're trying to do a deliberate negotiation. This is what's working against you. Riddles are a real good way of demonstrating how strong the system is. Now, I've just told you about systems one. I'm going, okay, I'm gonna use systems two in this riddle because that's what it's all about. But the problem is you can't turn it off. You can only manage Systems one and systems two relationship. Here's your first riddle. All right, you're going through the alphabet right now. I'm going, what the heck? Okay, it's because your brain is locked on to the E and the word letter, okay? There's multiple definitions of the word letter. So anybody got an answer for me? Envelope, okay? Here's your second riddle. I mean, I already know what's going through your brain. You're actually at your front door and you just made three left turns, okay? The fun part about this riddle is a nine-year-old can solve it because they don't have a mortgage. And that's what, you know, the little thing about thinking differently. If you thought about this, well, maybe I'm hosting a party. Hopefully not this. You leave home plate. You make three left turns. You come back and these two people are at mass. It's the, it's the catcher and the, and the umpire, okay? But your brain, even if you try to be imaginative, your brain goes, oh, I got a solution for that, and it stays at the forefront. You actually have to push it out of the way. If you're thinking about this, I need to talk to you after the lecture, okay? <laughs> okay, so that's systems one and systems two. And we'll talk about how to engage it in a few slides. What's another thing that gets in your way? Bias. Anybody in here unbiased? Thank you, we have 100% honest room. 
Okay, we're all biased. It's normal. Again, everything I talk about in this in this uh, lecture is I'm describing things. I'm not evaluating them. I'm not assigning value to them. The problem with bias is, uh, in a way, it, it, it does help systems one. Okay, helps speed up that process. And again, it's all about survival in that brain. Gets that reaction reflex going, and some of you are going crazy already because your bias is for slides to build from top to the bottom, and this one doesn't. It's built over time and experience. The more successful and the older you are, the stronger your bias is. It is a fact. Everybody has a different set of biases. They are personalized lenses, and they do these things. Why? Because you're an in information overload. You've got so much information coming in, your biases actually help filter through that, all that chaff to find out the one or two nuggets of wheat that you need to make that decision. This is normal human behavior. In an effective and a creative negotiation, you've got to manage that bias, okay? It's a good thing for everyday decisions, okay? When you drive down the road, uh, my car automatically goes into a Chevron station, okay? It, that's my bias because it's got a chemical in there called Tecron, and if I don't put it in my Corvette, guess what? The fuel gauge dies in about 60 miles. It's just a flaw in the system. Bias is absolutely normal, but it's usually emotional, okay? I took off. My first offensive little microaggression, I'm going to put on another. Anybody, anybody a Bama fan? All right, all right, roll tide. Okay, we've automatic, we're talking right here. Why? We formed an association based on a bias. Okay, this is where I got my degree from. My best friend's an Auburn grad. We only hate each other three hours a year. Okay, during Iron Bowl, third Saturday in October. We all have biases. They're normal. They, they help us form associations. Look at that. Throw that hat down. Nick Saban, don't look at me. Okay. How many folks own a sports car? Do you belong to the association associated with that sports car? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Because it's like-mindedness. It's fun, okay? How many folks belong to the alumni association of your university or school that you went to? Lots of you do, okay? This is okay because it, it's part of our human nature to be with like-minded people. It builds echo chambers. It's comfortable. The thing is, with negotiations, you've got to kind of manage that bias because a lot of times solving the problem is an uncomfortable thing to do. Anybody like to go car shopping and negotiate for a car? Not a whole lot of folks like to do that. Some do, which is fine, absolutely. And I can talk to you offline how I got that vet, okay? I put the slide up for a purpose because every single one of you is going to interpret a slide differently because of your bias, okay? Uh, if my daughter was here, she would lock onto that because she loves the quilt. How many folks own Harley Davidsons? Any motorcycle folks? Way back there? What would you call that one in the upper left hand corner? A Harley Davidson? It's a, Vul a Vulcan motorcycle. It's not a real motorcycle. It's not a Harley, okay? Uh, a lot of folks, this is meaningless. That's where I got my start. I had my pilot's license and gliders before I had my driver's license. Uh, why is this up there? Because in 2012, Alabama beat Notre Dame in the national championship, okay? And I actually got to attend that game. This one is my fun one, because all the Americans are going, yeah, baseball, apple pie, football. All the internationals are going, why is the world's most popular sport in the background? That's their bias, okay? And some folks are going, uh, is that really a sport? <laughs> if you ever tried badminton, yes, it is really a sport, okay? This one freaks me out for you folks that are woodworkers. Long sleeve shirt, oh my God. The push stick that he should be using is over here. And I don't think those are safety glasses. I'm kind of a safety freak when it comes across uh, blades because I'd like to keep my 10 fingers, okay? Everybody has got bias. It's okay. The bad part about it is it's subconscious most of the time, unless you actively manage it, unless you acknowledge that you have a bias and you're going, okay, I'm going to try to manage this one as best I can. If you don't watch it, you don't have enough info, you fill in the blanks with stuff that agrees with you. It's called, it's called a confirmation bias. If you have too much, it selects out the stuff that agrees with you, okay? You, you, you're throwing stuff out. That's called staff work. We'll talk about that in a second here. <laughs> bias creates ruts in the mind. It's tough to be creative, okay? Because you've got this, they uh, surveyed American families uh, that do a lot of cooking at home, and they basically have about 10 different menu items for dinner that they rotate through. They get in a rut, okay? That's why these new, uh, where they ship you the food in the box overnight kind of thing is becoming so popular because it, cr it creates creativity. 
somebody has introduced a creative way to get out of that rut of eating the you know, Taco Tuesdays and all that kind of stuff. Effective negotiations requires you to frame things in a creative new way. Bias gets in your way. That's all I'm saying. You have to manage it. I'm going to build this slide real quick. All right. The yellow ones are the ones that most often affect negotiations. Uncertainty bias, we have a strong need to manage risk. We don't like losses. If you ever want to get somebody to agree with you, say, if you don't do this, you're going to lose this. Folks, uh, more risk averse. If you give somebody equal odds, uh, they did this experiment. Uh, it's, a, it's a set of parents, and they said, look, there's a vaccine out there, and your child has got an illness, and this vaccine has got a 90% chance of curing this illness. Otherwise, it gets really, really serious, almost like a COVID situation. Overwhelmingly, parents said, yeah, get the kid the vaccine. Another group of parents, same demographic cross-section, they said, it, same situation, except they framed it differently. It says, this is a vaccine that's got a 10% chance of killing your child. It could be fatal 10% of the time. How many of you want to administer the vaccine? Overwhelmingly, the parents said, uh-uh. They framed it in a negative manner. Folks are risk aversive. So if you want them to agree with you, frame it negatively, okay? Confirmation bias, staff work versus research. Uh, everybody here works for a boss. Everybody wants to make that boss look good. Invariably, most bosses have the answer already kind of preconceived. Why is the F-22 the greatest airplane ever built? That kind of thing. Uh, I'll go to my dissertation. Uh, I, I uh, was the RTC commander. Real quick, two ways to, uh, to judge an RTC scholarship applicant. One's the academic side, which is very reliable and valid, ACT, uh, you know, those kind of things, and uh, the advanced placement courses. And the other one is that leadership component when they come out of high school. And it's made up of all sorts of leadership things they did in high school. Captain the football team, cap, pra, class president, class treasurer, uh, downtown, they worked in the church and did this and did that. And that came with a leadership score. And you combine the two scores, and if you made the cut line, you got a scholarship. And if you didn't make the cut line, you didn't get a scholarship. Well, I was a brand new RTC commander. I'm an academy grad. I don't know anything. So I keep my mouth shut. And I ask one question. How do we know that being the captain of the football team leads to good leadership in Air Force ROTC? I got the big dough staring at the headlights. So that was my dissertation. I did a survey of 19,000 Air Force ROTC cadets, the freshman cadets. I asked them what they did in high, in high school, both the amount of stuff they did and the depth. In other words, you got more, more points for being the captain of the football team than a four-year bench warmer. Took all that data, ran it through a program. I had nine hypotheses that, you know, if you were the captain of the football team or class president, you'd probably make a good leadership. I had zero of my hypotheses supported. None. All right. Now, had I done staff work, and I, this is non-attribution, so don't pin it on me, but I bet you back in the early 1950s, we're going to go to the Pentagon where they're deciding on the criteria to award high school scholarships to Air Force ROTC cadets. First of all, it's a room, and it's smoke-filled, right, because that's the early 50s. Who's sitting around that room besides rank general officers? Who are they? Captain of the football. They're probably all white. They're probably all pilots. And they probably leaned back in their chairs and they went, well, I was a captain football team. Oh, I was a class president. I was an Eagle Scout. I was this, I was that. I bet you that's how they did it. They confirmed within their own experience instead of letting data answer the question. So the data says there are no predictors in high school activities that predict leadership in Air Force ROTC. So that's, a that's the thing about research is you ask the question and you fight your confirmation bias and you say, let the data, because sometimes the answer to the research question is no. Okay? Last one, escalation bias, we all know that. It's really hard to cut off a program because sunk costs, you, you, you think they're real costs, when in actuality, you should consider them as sunk costs. They're not worth anything to you. That's a hard one to overcome in, in negotiations in the military. Cutting off a program is tough. Now I'm going to introduce an industrialist real quick. Henry Ford, he's one of my heroes. Systems one thinking and change. Why do I bring in the word change? Because that's what you're going to lead as a senior leader. You're going to make change in whatever position you're in. Services and militaries and governments are constantly changing the approach to solving problems, so, you know, whatever the national priorities are. Well, his was, here was his challenge. It's the early 1900s, and he's introducing his car. And his sales were miserable. But he was doing systems one thinking. First of all, he's an urbanite. He's 
educated engineer at some prestigious schools. 75% of Americans still live on a farm. Totally different culture, folks. He said, get rid of your horse, get a car. Okay. For us, we kind of look at a horse and say, okay, yeah, this is 2021. What a big deal. Back then, what did they do with horses? They were members of the family. They gave them names. They had pedigrees. They were, uh, I don't know how many folks out here came from farms. You've, there's an association and, and a love for these animals. And now you wanted me to get rid of something that I absolutely love? Are you crazy? Car sales were horrible until he reframed it, okay? Changed the frame of mind and said, okay, change is coming. How would you like to get your stuff to market more efficiently? How would you like to be able to go beyond subsistence farming and actually sell your surplus to a local market? Well, a horse-drawn carriage only goes about three to five miles an hour, while this vehicle will get you there five times faster and carry a lot more. Sales skyrocketed. It's all about framing, folks. Here's another problem with your ego. It's a systems one function, by the way. Anybody ever go to a staff meeting with a, a second best idea? No. You show you've done your homework, you're proud of your work, you go to the staff meeting, you do the briefing, and you say, I recommend, and then somebody else in the audience goes, well, have we thought about this? Your brain automatically goes into defensive mode. Now, wait a minute. We have a hard time with new information. And guess what? Good question asking in a negotiation results in new information coming to the table. You gotta check your ego at the door. That's what Colin Powell once said about negotiations. Because that's a hard thing to overcome. You take a lot of pride in your work, folks. You don't show up with the second best idea. You show up with a good idea. And it's hard. Here's the other problem with systems one. If it's different, it's wrong. Okay? I'm gonna take you all out to lunch. Free? Free lunch. How many, how many folks like a free lunch? Raise your hand if you like a free lunch. All right, great. We're going to go to a local restaurant. It's really cool. And the main course is Boishel. How many folks still want to go to lunch with me? <laughs> God, I've got two hands raised. A whole bunch said, I'll take a free lunch. And a whole bunch of folks dropped their hands when it came to the, first of all, you don't know. Anybody know what Boishel is? Okay, so you've never seen it. You've never smelled it. you never tasted it. But you've all made, you've already rejected it because your brain sees it as different and it's wrong. I happen to agree with you, Boishel is boiled calf's lung. It's really not that good a dish, okay? So you, you guessed good that time. But that's the problem with our systems one. If it's different, it's wrong. Because if it wasn't different, we'd be doing it, and we only do things that are right. This is your natural brain process you need to think about. Third thing, okay, we talked about system one, system two, bias, and now we're going to talk about ways our brain automatically says yes without thinking. And uh, the readings alluded to it, C. Uh, C. Aldini, uh, his book, Influence, you don't have to read it because I'm going to tell you in exactly 90 seconds what you need to know. Whoops, go back. You do something nice for somebody, your brain registers that they're going to have to do something nice for you. That's why when, uh, when you go into sales, they always offer you a cup of coffee and those kind of things. When I worked at the Pentagon, I always found out the office I was going to that action officer I was going to deal with, I wanted to know. I called the exec usually. What's that person's favorite drink? Coke, Diet Coke, coffee, whatever. And I would show, hey, I just happened to be. And we sit down and he'd already have a, he or she would already have a cup of coffee in front of him. I used reciprocity to my advantage. Okay? Nothing wrong with it. Scarcity. Shanwell commercials. Got to buy them now. Yeah, like the factory's going to shut down. I don't think so. But the concept of scarcity makes people buy stuff. Authority. Uh, the reason why they have computer printouts now when you go to the car dealership for service is because the, the grease monkey used to come out and write stuff down you know, on a piece of paper and say, oh, your car needs $2,000 worth of repair, and you go, really? Well, now the technician comes out. First of all, the technician and the grease monkey are two, two different people. And the technician, the uh, representative, is what? In a golf shirt, slacks, always looking sharp, he or she, doesn't matter. And they've got this nice little pad thing, and they scan the the, the, the VIN number or code on your car and uh, put the ODB reader in there and then they go, computer spits out something and it says you need $2,000 worth of work. Guess what? Most folks will agree to have it done. Why? Because they look authoritative, okay? Consistency and commitment. If you get somebody to agree with something uh, in principle, that's why when negotiations always start with an agreement in principle. Because then later on, when folks start disagreeing, you go, well, wait a minute, your stand here is 
not congruent with your agreement and principle back here. People like to be consistent with their thought process and their agreements. Uh, during the Korean War, our POWs were mistreated, and I'm not going to say they were treated well at all, but the first couple of meetings were all about, you know, are you getting water, are you getting food, how about a cigarette, and then the North Korean, the interrogator, was usually Chinese, would say, you know, hey, uh, uh, North Korea is not perfect. You know, is America perfect? Of course not. This is back in the 50s. We still had Jim Crow laws. We still had segregation. Uh, a couple of meetings later, is, you know, here are the three things that are wrong about North Korea. You know, tell me the three things that are wrong about the United States, and they'd discuss it. And eventually, they'd have the POW write down those things. And if they refused to do it, basically the Korean interior would say, well, wait a second, you've just said all these, why are you changing your mind now? What's wrong with you? So it's an incredibly powerful tool. Social proof, how many folks got kids? Everybody else has got a latest, you know, I've got to get one too. This is the way your brain automatically agrees without even you thinking about it because of these little, uh, I think the reading called it click work. And of course, liking similarity. I leveraged this one at the Pentagon. If I was a new person in the office, I would always take somebody that this third person would identify with and like, and they would introduce me as the new guy and some of that liking would transfer. These are all natural things, okay? You, why do I bring this up now? One, you can use them. Two, you can know if they're being used on you, okay? Because negotiations is, is, there's some offense and there's some defense too. Offer exercise. There's an imaginary amount of money on the table and I'm gonna get you to uh, either agree or disagree with my offer, okay? If uh, I'm going to have an offer on the table, I'm going to say one, two, three. If you want the offer, raise your hand. If you don't want the offer, keep your hand down. If you're keeping your hand down, that means all the money disappears. Nobody gets anything, okay? So the first offer is $100 on the table. No strings attached. This is just instant money. I offer you 50. I keep 50. If you want this agreement, raise your hand. One, two, three. Yeah, okay? Next offer. I offer you 40. I keep 60. One, two, three. Oh, a few less. I get you 20, I keep 80. One, two, three. About the same amount. 1090. One, two, three. About the same, a few less. 298. One, two, three. <laughs> eh, almost nobody. All right. How many folks think they're a rational thinker? Okay. Well, <laughs> good. You're honest with yourselves. If you're a rational thinker, you'd accept this offer because it made you better off. But it's not fair. Rational thinking sits in systems two. Fairness sits in systems one. That's, a, that's an emotional thing. It's not fair. You're, okay? Here's the last one. I, I offer you 50 bucks. How many folks want to take it? One, two, three. More hands go up. Well, you don't know this, but there's $1,000 on the table. I just kept 950 and you got 50. Your rational side of your brain is going, oh, it's okay, I got 50. The emotional side of your brain is going, Son of a gun. that wasn't fair. It's amazing how your brain is in constant conflict with each, and all the time you're trying to negotiate, okay? Just be aware of this. What's your bias? This is not Mississippi. It's in Maine, okay? Got to go to air power, right? Here's your air power example of systems one, systems two thinking, all that stuff. Ernst Dudet, World War I. Now it's the eve of World War II. He's the Luftwaffe quartermaster general, which means he's buying stuff. He was demonstrated ground control radar. The Brits were working on the uh, oboe system, and the Germans were working on their system. He had a strong systems one, folks, because this is what he said. This is a senior leader, all right? He also required all bombers to be able to dive bomb. Okay, so you're thinking maybe a Stuka-styled airplane. What's a 177? It is a 20-ton, four engine. There's two engines in each one of those nacelles. Can you imagine going 60 degrees nose low with that? They only made about five of them and they ripped the wings off of everyone. Can you imagine being the tail gunner in that poor thing? Okay. That's the source, Misguided Weapons. Great book. A, that's a great airport read about how senior leaders have made some pretty interesting deci de decisions. Okay. Tactics, techniques, and procedures. Now I've talked about all the things that are wrong with our brain and how do you overcome them. It's really straightforward. The recipe is to slow your brain down and use critical thinking and active listening, the two most powerful tools you have, but you just have to realize that you got to use them, okay? The standard, who, what, when, where, why, how much. Remember that question versus period comment I made earlier when you're influence exercise, when you're trying to talk to each other? 
It's all about asking questions repeatedly. It's almost like being a five-year-old. Why? Why? You know, when they're trying to explain life to them. Active listening, very fundamental. Do you listen to understand? That's using system two or respond, systems one. How many folks, when they're having a conversation, get constantly interrupted? That's listening to respond by the other person. How many folks have been in a staff meeting and they have proposals on the table and somebody crosses their arm and goes, oh, it's not going to work. That's systems one thinking. Instead of going, why don't you think it's going to work? Tell me how you'd make it better, okay? Two simple tools, very hard to use because we're in a rush to get to that door instead of thinking about the process that's going to get us there, that little bit more deliberate process. Some techniques now for critical thinking. I like to limit folks. I don't like to ask them what makes them mad because they could go on for hours, okay? What are the three things that make you upset about this situation, okay? How do I come at it another way? I'm looking at it from a financial perspective. Give me the engineering perspective. Give me some other perspective. I love this because uh, they put up these speed signs all over town and accidents went up, okay? It was designed by a 45, 50 year old safety person. Why did accidents go up? People trying to max it out, okay? Now you're all going, well, I'm a senior leader, I'm better than that. How many folks got a GPS in their car? Okay, what does ETA stand to for? Time to beat. <laughs> Come on, you all do it, okay? This is an 18-year-old wants to make this thing go 99. The, the, the person with the life insurance policy who's 45 and designed it says, well, this is going to be good for safety. They actually, what they've done now is they've modified these things. They blank out at about you know, 10 miles over the limit. So you can't make it go 99 anymore. Again, read the rest of these. What are the shortfalls? Followed by why do you think it's a shortfall? What would you change? Why would you change it? These are all effective ways to engage critical thinking, engage your systems to and make you a more effective negotiator. What's most important to you and why? Because that moves folks from positions, what I want, okay, to what I need. I need a fully mission-capable aircraft. That's, that's me, an operator, talking to a maintainer. Maintainer goes, what do you need for this sortie? Well, I really just need the radios to work, you know, and the engines to run. You have a negotiation there between ops and maintenance. This moves you from self-reliant thinking, i.e. engaging in negotiation with only what's in between your ears to a cooperative approach by getting more information on the table. Now, you, is this always gonna work? This is not a checklist. Negotiations is not a checklist. It's not read a step, do a step, get a banana, get the same result every time. It is a guide. It'll improve your chances for success. It doesn't guarantee success. Active listening to me is pretty simple. It's these four things. Attend, clarify, pro, sum, summarize. Attend means while I'm having a conversation with you, you are the most important person in my life. I'm not going to be staring at my watch or my cell phone or anything else like that, okay? I'm going to make us with eye contact if that's socially and culturally permitted. Some, so, some cultures don't have direct eye contact, and you have to understand that. And then once they finish talking, I'm going to ask some clarifying questions. What I hear you say is, is this what you mean? Let me make sure I understand, and then I'll probe. Is there another element to this? Is there another issue to this? Is there some second, third, or nth order effect from this? And then I'll summarize. What I heard you say is, now this sounds real cheesy, and you're all the warriors out there, and you want to get to that door because that's you know, where the solution lies. Well, the process to get to that door is filled with critical thinking and active listening in your senior leader environment when there's not a crisis. If buildings are on fire, people are dying, and airplanes are crashing, yes, you've got to use systems one. Otherwise, these are the methods to engage systems two. <clears throat> Changing frames of mind. Basic military training graduation parade. Uh, back in late 1990s, there was a problem up at um, uh, Aberdeen Proving Grounds with some uh, training instructors having sex with the trainees. Not verboten, not, good, not a good idea. Congress had a blue ribbon commission and they wanted to separate the genders in basic training. All the women train over here and all the men train over there. And Marines at that time were gender separate training. The Army, the Air Force, and the Navy were gender uh, combined training. They had separate dorms, but during the day they marched together, they went to class together, yada, yada, yada. I'm the BMT commander. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission is headed up by a Senator K. Bailey Hutchinson. Okay, let's talk about the typo model, power. How much have I got next to a senator as a ranking member? Uh, none, okay. So I can't exactly go in like a bull in a china shop and say, you're wrong, lady. We don't need gender separate training. I know, I'm the BMT commander. Thank God, how many JAGs do we have in this room? 
Any lawyers? Bless lawyers. Saved my butt. Uh, Rick McDonald was my JAG at uh, basic training. He said, Steph, do your damn homework. Do your homework. Find out about Kay Bailey Hutchinson. Find out what's important to her interests. Texas, yes, thank you very much. She's a graduate of the University of Texas. She loves the University of Texas. She went to law school at the University of Texas. Did I tell you she loves Texas? She loves the University of Texas. She grew, in a t grew up in a town just south of Galveston, Texas, a little town. Okay? I did my homework. Here's how it went. Uh, I had a military training instructor, male, who happened to go to that very, very high school. Now, different generations, obviously, but in that hometown. <coughs> Guess who met her at the gate? My ultra-sharp female T.I., who's from that hometown. She's the one that did the tour of basic training. And that's a pretty spectacular tour, it really is. It's quite a facility. About an hour and 50 minutes later, they're coming into the conference room at the headquarters, and they're best friends. What have I just done to the typo model? Trust. They've got trust between the two of them. Then what do I do with the C. Aldini influence association? You know, hey, this T.I. kind of likes her boss. Okay, Kay Bailey, maybe some of that will transfer. And we sat down, we had a discussion. What did we talk about? We talked about the University of Texas. We talked about her experience as an undergrad. We talked about her experience at law school. Did I tell you she liked the University of Texas? She loved the University of Texas. And then I started asking her, well, you were a student there. Did you feel safe? She said, absolutely, I felt safe at the University of Texas. When you were a law student there, did you feel safe? She said, absolutely, I felt safe there. It's a great school. I said, do you think folks going to the University of Texas today feel safe? Well, absolutely. Now, that's consistency and commitment, right? So I said, well, I showed her one slide, one slide only. What do you think it was? Sexual assault rate at basic training compared to the University of Texas. And it wasn't a little different. It was ordinal different. University of Texas way up here, we're way down here. And she leaned over and she said, you got me. And I said, no, ma'am. We have a common interest. That's the most important thing about a negotiation is trying to find something in common. It was safety. And I said, I want safety for both the male and the female trainees. And this is the statistics we have right now. And this is what we've got in place to support those statistics. And this is what we're doing to continue to improve safety on this campus. Now, I'm not saying that my negotiation with her ended up in keeping basic training as an integrated training environment. But what we did is we changed the frame of mind. Because I guarantee I could have hammered her over the head all the day for about two seconds. And she would have told me to sit down shut up because she had the power. I could have said, you know, I know better, we should do this because I know better. No, that's not going to work, folks. I had to change the frame of mind to something that was in common. All right? Sit engaging systems, too. In short, you assess here, you look at a strategy here, and then during the negotiation, you're constantly going back and forth. Hopefully, you're increasing trust. Hopefully, you're sharing power. Hopefully, you get to sharing information and, and working on multiple options. Now, the nice thing about what, which option you finally select as a solution? Well, if you have identified interests, hey, if this solution meets my top three interests and your top three interests, then I think that's the solution we ought to go with. And sometimes that's not the solution you thought initially. Something to think about. Okay. If you don't, systems one is going to kick in and you're going to have, in, you have improvisation. You're going to react to your basic instinct to get to that door as fast as you can. And for me, I'm an ESTJ. I will head for that door as fast as I can. I will use the insist strategy, even if I don't have the power, and I'm going to make some options. I'm going to make some mistakes. I have to slow my brain down. Now, again, if there's a crisis, it's different. Intercultural. I'm not going to talk about behaviors. I'm not going to talk about food or anything. We're going to talk about way down here, beliefs and values, how folks approach life, how their brain is organized by their culture. Now, we talked about wiring diagrams, okay? Systems one and systems two, everybody has that, no matter what culture you're in. Bias, every culture has that, okay? But what's different in your upbringing that wires your brain in a certain way? <clears throat> These differences are hard to see. You have to examine them. You have to think about them. You have to ask questions about them, maybe. Here's your systems two response and your systems one response when you see a different culture. <clears throat> I'm going to use the Hall's high-low context model. Some of you folks might be familiar with it. It's not an either-or. It's actually a spectrum, and, and folks lie along that spectrum. It's not homogenous to an entire nation or culture. 
you have a very, very low context culture in New York City compared to Sumter County, Alabama, which is a lot more high context culture, okay? Low context, egalitarian, get down to first names real quick. It's what I do in the introduction, okay? Socially mobile, I'll talk about that in a second, how that affects your approach to negotiating. And results based, it's what I do, what do I get done? High context cultures. To be, it's who I am, my family lineage, what I represent. Socially stable is, is an important thing. Change comes more slowly. It's relationship built. I must know you before I deal with you. Now let's talk about this socially mobile and socially stable. This was uh, emphasized to me by a Saudi student many years ago. And I set him up, he was in my seminar, and I set him up and I said, beforehand, I said, I'm gonna do this, is this okay? He was a cool dude. And he said, yeah, sure, you can do that. So uh, we're walking to seminar and we're going, okay, folks, uh, your prof has just screwed up today and I just got a call from the three star and I'm fired. What do you think I'm gonna do? And the seminar went, oh, that's too bad. That sucks to be you. <laughs> Guess what? I'm in America. I'm gonna float my resume. I'll move to Oregon. I'll do the, I'll reinvent myself. Okay, quote a, fa a famous term in our, in our life. No problem, I'll move. I'll even change professions if I have to. Mohammed, dude, yeah. How about you become Catholic tomorrow? No. Okay. Muhammad, dude, how about if you move your family 100 clicks down the road to this other town? No. Okay. We went through several of these things. Why? Because what's important to that culture is the identity with that family, that location. Now, I don't have to go across the ocean to do that. My, fa my wife's family is from some, my first wife. I lost her to cancer three years ago. She's, low she's very high context. She is family oriented to Sumter County, Alabama. Okay, very hierarchical. Boy, I, I, it's all sir and ma'am and all that kind of good stuff. It's not first names. It's I'm the son and daughter of, and they find a lot of identity and they go back to that place that gives them that identity. They're not socially mobile versus low context. And this is generally speaking industrialized countries and locations. This is more traditional, okay? Relationships are incredibly, they can go back and on her side of the family, they can go back six and seven generations and who's related to who and all this kind of, and who's important in the family. It's really interesting. And how, that, how does that affect the negotiation? Well, what it does is it makes the negotiation a little more personal to that, that individual from a high context culture. It's how does it affect me and my family and my clan and my group? Versus if you're negotiating, you're negotiating against, well, how does it affect my budget and my plan and my strategy? Totally different perspectives. Conflict's pretty normal in our culture, in this low context culture. In fact, it's celebrated, okay? If they don't break, doesn't, if it's not broken, break it. You've heard that before. Japanese culture is probably the most high context culture when it comes to harmony. They have a special symbol in their language for it. And harmony is, is preserved at, at, a, at great cost because it maintains that fabric of the relationships between the people. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, that's the way the, the society values the individual. Low context cultures tend to be more industrialized, got more resources. You combine that with more social mobility, it's easier to take risk. Uh, a uh, Pakistani officer, we, had a, we were having a cup of coffee one time, and he says, and I I'm, was working on my house, and I had bought ladders, and I, I broke one. And he said, what do you Americans do when you break a ladder? And I said, well, go to Home Depot and buy a new one. He says, in Pakistan, we take very good care of the one ladder we have, okay? Less abundant resources, less social mobility, less preference to take risk. So the negotiation, instead of rushing for that door, it's gonna be incremental steps for the person that's more risk averse because that risks the least amount of loss. It also minimizes the least the, 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 the gain, but that's a way to approach negotiations. We, uh, we love challenging authority. No big deal, okay? It's a very acceptable in our, in our, tr our low-context culture. Uh, if you think we're crazy, go to the British House of Commons. I love to go to the, the BBC when they're broadcasting what the, uh, the, uh, when the Prime Minister goes to the House of Commons. They're almost having fistfights down there, okay? Leadership directs. You've got a country or a culture that's been around 5,000 years. That's something to be 
pay attention to. How, is, how does 5,000 years, it's ensured our continuity. Let's pay attention to what's behind us. Let's not go, everything, whoops, every, everything's a white sheet. You know, tomorrow is, is a clean break from yesterday. In these cultures, no, very, very careful. You, our culture, we'll take that hard right, 90 degree turn and see what happens. And if we screw it up, guess what? We'll take another hard left and we'll make some corrections. In this culture, that hard right might be catastrophic. Something to think about. And I'm seeing some of my internationals going like this already. Okay. We learn from failure. That's how we improve. Hot washes and all that stuff. They learn about how consistency is ensured survival. It's not an us-them. It's not a bipolar. There's all sorts of different places on this scale. Okay. Different elements. Time is a commodity. We waste it. We save it. We spend it. We do this and that with it. Okay. Time builds respects and relationships. After we build that relationship, we'll get things done. I had a, an officer come to me when I was a dean, and he, uh, I needed some help on some research that concerned internationals. And uh, he was from a high-context culture. I'm not the brightest bulb on the block, okay? And I did know that this, this troop liked coffee, so we sat down, drank coffee, and we talked about flying airplanes, and we talked about soccer because I coached soccer and he played soccer. And About the fourth meeting, we finally got around to business, and I let him, sir, what do you need done? And I said, well, I got these five areas that I need to have addressed from an international perspective, and I could really use your help. And you know, now I'm setting anchors and all that other stuff that you've been doing in your readings, and I'm going, oh, man, if you could do two, that'd be great. Okay, and I'd be happy with one. He comes back a couple of weeks later. How many has he done? All five. And I read through it real quick, and I'm going, man, it's good work. And I said, I got to ask you, I know this took some time, but I really would have been happy with just one. He said, sir, he says, you're a colonel, you're a doctor, you're the dean, you've got a lot of important things to do. You spent time with me. You showed me respect and built a relationship. I was obligated to do this in my culture. Now, does that work every time? No. But you can see how different perspectives, had I just rushed in and said, hey, dude, great, I haven't got the time because I'm a busy person, I really need three things done, da -da. He might have done one because he would have responded in a culturally appropriate way. Okay. We think we have more control over our environment and our destiny. Okay. We make five and 10 and 15 year plans versus a high context culture that says, you know, God's willing. Now we have the same saying too, you know, up the creek without a paddle and, you know, up the creek don't rise and all that. We do too, but we still think we have a stronger ability to, to control the, the environment we live in. And if you don't, if you think that there's a lot more other controls, you're probably not going to want to make a long-term agreement that's going to go all the way back to that door. You're probably going to lead to incremental agreements. Okay. Make a step, see how that turns out, and take that. And guess what that does? That requires you to renegotiate. And get what that renegotiation means, more relationships. Okay. And more relationship building. And examining that type of model. How is trust coming along? How we share an information? Have a conversation about this up in the seminar today. Internationals, you've got different perspectives. Folks from different parts of this country are going to have different perspectives. I guarantee you somebody who grew up in Queens, New York is going to have a different approach to life than somebody who grew up in, in South Louisiana. Okay? Multi-party. It's very different within two-party in many, many ways. But I'm just going to emphasize a couple things how they relate to the model. Okay, building trust with one party may alienate another. It's really easy when it's two party because it's just back and forth. Now you got four or five or six or ten people. Well, and you're talking to this person, maybe you're having lunch with them, maybe you're, you're meeting them first at the, at the meeting, the introductions, and you strike up a relationship. Or guess what? You find out that they have the same interests you do in sports and whatever. So you, what does that mean to the other nine as far as trust building? You have to think about your interactions with one person, how it affects the other folks in the, in the negotiation. The thing about information in multi-party is that not everybody's at every meeting and not all the information's heard equally. Sometimes they're required as translation, sometimes interpretation of those kind of things. And private conversations are crucial in multi-party, but how do they hurt the relationship to the person that's excluded? Okay? If you want a real trust killer, in a, and I've seen this done, okay? I, I, I do seminars uh, you know, downtown and across the state and different universities. Somebody, during a negotiation, first of all, you can't hide this. 
They're texting somebody else in the negotiation. Beep, <laughs> goes off across the What do you think the other three people in that room were thinking at the time? Boy, trust just went down the tubes and it became very, in fact, they had to take a break, okay? What are you doing? Uh, of course, then they lie about it and guess what? You lie once, trust is out the door. Power will ebb and flow because in multi-party, you're gonna have coalitions. The second exercise you do today is a multi-party. Watch how you're gonna have, a, some parties are gonna have agreement. Two parties out of three will have agreement in one area and the third party will be the outlier. See what happens to the group dynamics. Because guess what? Oh, I've got an opportunity to actually get something done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to team up with you. You're on my side. And all of a sudden, the third side's out in the cold. Then later on, all of a sudden, well, you and I don't agree, but we'll agree on something. All of a sudden, how do you handle these ebbs and flows in, in use of power in, in these temporary coalitions? Okay. I would suggest that when you do these things, you have doggone good rationale. And you explain to the, the out party, this is why this is important, or... You say, look, I need to work with this one on this issue, but I can work with you on that issue, okay? Explain yourself. That's probably a good way to put it. More people in a group means more ideas. Also, the problem is groupthink and time pressures because you want to get something done. It's not the leader in a multi-party that counts. It's the first follower. They've done experiments with this. Hey, I got a great idea. And the leader stands up and everybody else in the room is, Ugh. Then all of a sudden, somebody from the back of the room stands up and says, I think that's a good idea, too. First follower. Then all of a sudden, folks start to fall in line. Wait, wait, wait a second. I haven't agreed yet, but these two people are in agreement. Well, maybe I'm, I'm an outlaw. Oh, I'll join them. They've actually done these experiments where folks, the first follower is as important, if not more important, than the leader. Okay? Creates groupthink. That's the problem. If I see folks rushing in a multi-party, I, I do... Uh, what I do is I'm a moderator in multi-party negotiations. If I see folks rushing to a conclusion and it's not a crisis, I'm going, well, why is this idea so good right now? What would make it a bad idea? Asking questions, getting to challenge their own ideas. Who's talking to who? Okay, I'm talking directly to one person, but I'm indirectly communicating with them. I really care about your idea and your problems and, and, your, and I'm not talking to that person at all. What, what is this person thinking? I'm on my own. So think about your communication patterns. If I'm going to, I try real hard when I do a mediations and multi-party to spend equal time with all the parties. Okay, it's a psychological issue, but really folks don't like to be excluded in multi-parties. And what's the role? In a two-party, guess what? You generally have equal uh, authority as far as making a decision. In multi-party, you might just have a representative there from another party and you're the decision maker. And they've got to keep constantly leaving the table to find permission to do something or something else. And you're going to slow the process down. Well, maybe it's their culture, okay? Maybe their culture sends a representative, so if it's a bad idea, that person can come back and say, no, this just won't work. My leader won't allow it. It's a face-saving gesture. It's a culturally appropriate thing, okay? Here's a big challenge as a senior leader. Who you represent? Your boss, your office, your mission, your service, all of them? How do you balance those? Okay, I'm going to spend a gazillion dollars on my particular operation in my office, but it's really going to hurt the service budget. You, know, you have to balance those things in multi-party. And who, when you're doing two-party negotiations, a little more clarity in who you're representing and what your authority you have. Okay, you got to gain the broader view as a senior leader, but you can't forget of the, op the, the office that you represent, the, re the responsibilities you have of the particular assignment that you've got. Sometimes that's hard to do. All right, in the seminar, just some ideas. What do the first 90 seconds sound like? Get right down to business, maybe have a conversation. Uh, a lot of you are mixing seminars. You're going to be uh, talking to folks you haven't uh, been par part of your seminar for a while. What do, that, do you set an agenda? Say, I'd like to go top to bottom for these five items, or I'd like to try this one first because I think it's the easiest. Or do you set an agenda? How does that first 90, think about those first 90 seconds. Try to find out if there's anything in common interest in an, any negotiation. In the seminar upstairs, you can, the games, exercises are set up so that there is some common interest in certain areas, okay? Are you listening to understand? You do an active listening or listening to respond using systems two or systems one? How, what's your ratio of questions to periods? Hey, I need option A. Oh, that one won't work. Instead of, I need option A. Well, if you want option A, would you work with me on option whatever? Question mark. How do you understand what's most important to them? How do you elicit that information? 
What is, it, what is a showstopper for you in this negotiation? What can't you absolutely live without? How do you tell them what's important to you without divulging everything? Okay, one of the, you, unless, unless you've got ultimate trust, in other words, you're willing to put your life in this person's hands, you're probably not going to divulge all that information. You're going to be incremental. So how do I prioritize what information I provide first? If you get an offer that you didn't, didn't expect, how do you respond? Oh, it's ludicrous. Well, that does a lot for trust and communication. Versus, I had a, an outrageous quote one time on a car. Instead of going off on a tangent like stamping out of the room, I said, how did you come up with that number? Can you explain to me what in the price of the car, the prep, you know, all that kind of stuff? They didn't have an answer. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 15 minutes to come back with another number with those sub-numbers all added up. And the number came back and it was a lot lower. How do you react to something that you don't like or don't expect? I ask questions. How do you differentiate between what the other side wants? I want the moon versus what they need. I just like to have a margarita on the beach. Okay. You got to have this skill because your span of responsibility is this big, your span of authority is a lot smaller. You got to fill that gap somehow. Your brain is working against you. Your bias management, your systems one, systems two thinking, how you frame things. I got you some models to think about. Again, they're not checklists. They just help improve your chances if you use them. It also forces you to slow down your brain. How many folks are familiar with Yogi Berra? All right. He didn't quote this, but I'm going to, he's dead, so he can't fight this. Okay. It is. It's 90% practice and hot washing. Great negotiation center, great website, great resource. Uh, I, I appreciate them allowing me to come back as the old founding director to, to do this presentation. I, I love to give back to the War College. And uh, we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, if you have any questions you want to ask directly of me, that's my home email. These slides will be available, by the way. Okay. And that's the most important lesson right there. Okay. I don't need to write that down. I don't remember all that. Any questions? Uh, you know, the, the other problem with a PhD is half of the stuff they tell you is the absolute truth, and the other half is absolute a lie. So you've been subject to one hour and almost 15 minutes of 50 50, so it's up to you to figure out which is which. Any questions at all? Any comments? Yeah, it's all garbage. God, compliant audience. <laughs> God bless you. God bless the work that you do, and uh, enjoy your year here. It's a fantastic year. Thank you very much.